get us started? Certainly. Uh -huh. Good evening. So do, do we have people there? We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then plus the classroom. Okay, that's nice. Uh, Should thank I begin? You. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Karavitis, and I'm a graduate student here at DePaul. I'm working on my master's degree in physics. So I guess it would be sort of natural that I would uh, choose this topic. And tonight's topic is uh, the diffusion and Schrodinger equations. So this is, uh, this is a topic from chapter nine, section four. And in a way it's a very curious topic because the, the title of chapter nine is waves in space. And here I am talking about on the diffusion equation and second Schrodinger's equation, which is a physics uh, equation, a quantum mechanics equation. So what I'm gonna cover in this presentation is a few key points. As I noted, section 9.4 says, um, it's the diffusion and Schrodinger equations but the Schrodinger equation is a wave equation, it's not a diffusion equation. So the question is how can they be, how can these two concepts be connected? The solutions to the Schrodinger equation are oscillatory. So the natural question is what is diffusing or dispersing? And the, um, the answer is it's the probability of a particle being in a particular location at a particular time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through like the math of this, uh, uh, of all the key points here. And then I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna share some uh, simulations that'll, that'll uh, explain this topic a little bit more clearly. So, um, so the, one, the one typographical error that I do have in this presentation, plus all the wording, I'll make up for it by uh, showing some nice, uh, some nice movies. Okay, so the total energy of a system is the uh, sum of the kinetic and potential energies. And when you're talking about quantum mechanics, um, you're talking about the Schrodinger, the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation is very simple. It just says that if I have a system uh, designated by psi as a function of either position or position in time, then I apply the Schrodinger equation to this wave function and I get an eigenvalue equation, which basically tells me what the energy of the system is. So as you can see right now on the display, I've got two equations. And the first one is the, is the time independent Schrodinger equation which is what students are typically taught first. They're, ta they're typically taught the, the simpler version. And to the right there, you can see the representation of the state of the system. So that vector psi is a superposition of other states. Uh, when you add time into the equation, you get the second equation at the bottom here of this uh, slide. And the wave equation now is represented by a separable equation. One is dependent on time, and the other one dependent on position. So when you look at the Schrodinger equation, as our author notes on page 250, when you manipulate it a bit and all the dust settles, Strauss says, you know, quote, it looks suspiciously like the diffusion equation. And the reason, of course, is that at the very bottom of this slide, you can see the standard format of a diffusion equation. Uh, first derivative with respect to time is equal to some constant times the second derivative with respect to position. And it, and it certainly does look like what's been derived is a diffusion equation. However, the Schrodinger equation takes a wave function as its uh, argument. And therefore, the Schrodinger equation itself can't be a diffusion equation. The, the difference here comes from the fact that you have the uh, square root of negative one showing up. So, the, so that tells you that the solution of the Schrodinger equation is an oscillatory function, and that doesn't fit the model for the, the uh, diffusion equation, also known as the heat equation. So before I, before I continue digging deeper into this, I wanna take a step back. And since we are talking about diffusion and Schrodinger equations, you know, some basic fundamental concepts, you know, we're talking, we'll, we'll be talking about currents and divergences and you know that, you know, the basic idea is that if you have a current flowing in, uh, all the material or the charge or whatever of that current has to be conserved. So if you have a current flowing in, it should equal the sum of what's flowing out of your system and what's remained in the system. It's a very basic idea. Um, you can also apply this sort of, this idea to divergences, where if you have a source or a sink, you know, you can, you have conservation of what's going in or out and you're not losing anything on the system. Um, mathematically, you can, you can represent this 
by an equation. So you, you have some components you have to take a look at first. Let's assume you have a current, J, and then you're taking the, the divergence of the current. And if you have a negative divergence, you're basically having a current moving away from the source. On the flip side, you have a system flux that's represented by a time derivative. And if you equate these two, you have what's called a continuity equation. So the, the fluid density on the left-hand side is equal to the, div the negative divergence of the current. And in a sense, this continuity equation is a conservation equation. Again, going back to that model, what's going in is equal to what's coming out plus what's remaining. So, so we're talking about currents, we're talking about divergences, we're talking about diffusion. You know, I mean, again, this, this, this section in Chapter 9 is the diffusion equation and the Schrodinger equation, and how do they connect, especially since the Schrodinger equation is a wave equation, not a diffusion equation. So the question, of course, is what's diffusing or dispersing, and the quick and dirty answer is that it's the probabilities of the system. When you have a, when you have a, a wave function, like psi, you're basically saying, this is all the knowledge I have about the state of the system. So this wave function has to have certain characteristics, and one, of course, is that as, as x and t go to infinity, uh, the wave function has to go to zero. And the reason for that is because the, wave, the square of the wave function represents a probability density. So if I have a, a system and it could be in a, a superposition of states, then the probability that the system is in any one of those states will be the, the uh, square of the norm of the coefficient in front of that uh, that particular state. So the whole idea here is that uh, you're dealing with probabilities, and that's going to be the bridge to understanding why the Schrodinger equation, which is a wave equation, why it has diffusion components in it. Uh, we we describe probability densities in quantum mechanics by looking at the the square of the norm of the wave function, and the wave function can have complex components. As we saw earlier in the um, second slide, so for example, the very, the very bottom, the very last line on the right-hand side, we have a, uh, a time component, which is oscillatory, so that's why you have the uh, square root of, of negative one, and then you have your position component there, which is real, because you're in the real world. So let's, let's, let's try and connect everything together, okay? So we know we're dealing with probabilities, so let's, let's, take, this let's take a variable called rho, and let's let it equal the square root of the norm of the wave function. So to do that, of course, if the wave function can be complex, you're multiplying the complex, uh, the, the complex conjugate of the wave function times the wave function. And once we establish that, let's take the time derivative. So you take the time derivative of this new variable that we've equated to the probability density, and of course, you know, the product rule, the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first gives us the second line there. Uh, recalling the Schrodinger equation, we can substitute part, you know, we can substitute the Schrodinger equation directly into this equation. And then what happens is that we have a little bit of cleaning up and substitution. And then right before the last line, we notice that we have a second derivative with respect to position, and we pull one of those operators out. And what we have is basically the continuity equation. So if I have a probability density rho, which is what I let, what I said rho to be, then there must exist some kind of a probability current so that the, the continuity equation, which I mentioned earlier, exists. So let me just quickly scroll back here, uh, right here. These fundamental concepts regarding fluid currents and divergences, um, the, the fluid density, which is a change, is the change of the density with respect to time, is equal to the negative divergence of your current. And I, I very slick, slickly set it up so that now I have probabilities in quantum mechanics represented by a continuity equation. And so my probability current now is this, is this function j, as noted down there at the bottom. And you may wonder, it's like, okay, it's, it's very nice, but what does it all mean? And I will get to that very quickly. You look at this function and you say, well, what can we do with this? And I guess instinctively, one of the first things you can do is, well, can you integrate this? And if you do, what does it mean? So we take this, we take this, um, where'd it go? Right there, apologies. We, we take this um, probability density current and we integrate it from negative to positive infinity. 
and go through the motions. And what happens is, is that the integral of this probability density current times the mass of the particle in question is the expectation value of the momentum. And that's very nice because that's something very basic about a particle. Its position and its momentum are very basic quantities. And apparently its position in space and time depends on this probability density current. Um, this, this, this subject is briefly touched upon in the, the Griffith text. I haven't seen it in the McIntyre text. I don't recall seeing it in the Sakura text. And right now in my current quantum mechanics class, we're using the Townsend text. So I've, I, I've gone through four or five different quantum mechanics texts. I've seen it mentioned once. This isn't a topic that's really covered in depth, but as you'll see, it's really very, very interesting and important concept. So right now we have a uh, support for what we've described as a probability density current. And I know that still it's, it's like, okay, so what's the big deal? Okay, congratulations, you've linked this to the, the basic characteristics of a particle, which is its, its expected momentum, the expectation value of its momentum. Well, that's only half the story. And the other half of the story is gonna bring us to the diffusion part that's hidden inside the wave equation, which is the Schroeder equation. The expectation value of the momentum can be represented in what's called Brockhead notation, where you sandwich this operator, this momentum operator, between the wave function and its complex conjugate. And the equivalent of that is you're taking the integral of those, of those items. But the integrand itself, because you're dealing with, with complex factors, that integrand, which is in the, you know, the box in red, is going to have a real component and an imaginary component. And you can represent that, of course, by a complex number. Here it's J plus ID. And we already know what J is. J is the probability den density current. A probability, probability, uh, probability density current, right. So what happens when we integrate the prob this, this D item here? Well, we just got through integrating the integrand and we got that the integral of J basically is the expectation value of the velocity or times the mass is the ex expectation value of the momentum. That's the real part of this. But that means that if the, if the integrand has a complex component, then we should be able to integrate that, but this, this integral must be zero. And as I was, as I was, I was walking through this with my my quantum mechanics professor, he said, well, 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 it's a zero. What's the big deal? It's like, no, D isn't zero. The integral of D is zero. And when the dust settles, after you do the same kind of math that we did for the probability density current, what you find is that you've taken the Schrodinger equation and you've split it up into two parts. And they both deal with dealing with probability. And the probability density current this is J, it, it shows us how probabilities are conserved over time. What we just did now with the diffusion current density is we're showing how probabilities diffuse over space. And that's where we see what is referred to as the diffusion coefficient. So the diffusion part, the diffusion part of the Schrodinger wave equation is technically represented by Fick's first law of diffusion. Whereas the conservation of the probability over time is represented by Fick's second law of diffusion. Adolf Fick was a uh, scientist, mathematician, who uh, I think it was back in the mid-1800s, 1855. So these ideas, these diffusion laws are quite old, but the wave equation has been broken up into basically a diffusion equation and a conservation equation, actually two diffusion equations. And they basically show that probabilities diffuse over space. And I'm sure that you are wondering what this all means. And I have some simulations I'm going to share with you very quickly. So if we want to look at the probability density and probability current. So what we're seeing here on the, on the top is the square of the norm of the wave function. And the square of the norm of the wave function, what this is showing here is basically the probabilities are sloshing back and forth. Uh, the particle itself might not be moving, and it's in a, it, it could be in, in a, in a uh, potential well. Nevertheless, it has some energy, and these probabilities don't stay constant. They slosh back and forth. 
At the bottom, you'll see the uh, you see a graph of J, the probability density current, and it's changing as the probability slosh around. And in fact, the um, the slope of the square of the norm of the wave function is represented by the probability density current. If you if you recall that uh, we could have superpositions of uh, multiple states representing a particle, and again, uh, depending on the contribution, these probabilities slash back and forth. Again, this is this is a graph of psi squared, so it's a graph of the probability density. Uh, what you're seeing here is is technically beat. You've got two two states that a particle could be in. It's in a superposition of state. Each state has a probability of existing. And then when all the math gets done, what you find is you have a cosine term, an interference term, and that's what's making the probabilities slosh around. Oh, I promised you guys a little movie, right, for, to make up for all the wording here. Um, there's three examples I'm going to go through very quickly. One is a free particle. The other one is the, the particle in a box. And then the last one is the hydrogen atom. Um, if I have a free particle that's just shooting out there wherever, uh, I can't normalize the wave function. Uh, there's no way that I can get a coefficient in front of the integral so that I can make the probabilities uh, add up to one. And what's happening with a free particle is the probabilities diffuse. And the diffusion coefficient is the ratio of Planck's, const Planck's reduced constant to twice the mass. And if you look at the diffusion coefficient and ask, well, what's going on? What's going on is that a smaller, a smaller particle is going to be diffusing much more greatly than a larger particle. A larger particle has more mass. It'll be more, if I can use the word sluggish, it won't diffuse as much. Smaller masses will diffuse much more uh, easily. So here's my probability density again, my size squared. And because it's built of a wave packet, as time goes on, the probabilities spread out. So they're dispersing. And if you want to, if you, I mean, this is actually quite a nice, um, it's, a, it's a nice simulation, but if you look at, for example, a picture, if you want to see a picture that might make it uh, easier to grasp, at time zero, time zero at position zero, the, um, the particle is at the origin, and then when it goes out on a classical trajectory, the probability of word by B spreads out, it diffuses. Um, if you have a particle in a box, like a potential well, it's not going anywhere, and there's no time dependence because it's stuck in a box. So in this case, the probability of density current is zero. But in quantum mechanics, particles don't have zero energy. There's no such thing. Every particle has some zero point energy. And even though it's trapped in a box, there's a probability that it will be somewhere in the box, not necessarily stuck in one place. And again, I, well, here's a, here's a um, graph of the wave function. And um, let me give you the probability density graph. Uh, I don't think there's a play on this, but basically, basically, there's there's a there's a probability where this could be, uh, and it's not it's, it's and, and this is this is represented by the dispersive probability. It's not it's not moving, but yet it, it's not stationary. It's not going anywhere. It's stuck in a well, and yet there you have a spread of probability as to where it might be. So let me, um, one moment, please. Let me go back here. The final uh, example I want to look at is the hydrogen atom. And of course, you know, now you get, a, you get this 3D model and you have both the probability density current and the diffusion current density operating here. And the difference is that one describes the orbital motion around the Z axis, whereas the other one represents dispersive oscillation. And the difference between the two is that they are orthogonal. And there's a simulation I can show you on that, if you bear with me. Not a simulation, actually, but you know, if you, it's basically the same as this. You know, you, you have a nucleus at the, at the center, and then you have probability distributions as to where these electrons could be. Uh, if you want to look at a picture, for example, so this is the, this is the typical uh, electron orbitals around a hydrogen atom that you see in ten science textbooks, and the the top one shows you the probability densities where that, that center part shows you like the velocities as to where it's going. So in summary, you know, when you look at this wave equation called the Schrodinger's equation built into it is a way to break it out into two pieces that track probabilities and that show that probabilities are conserved and that they disperse over time. 
So over time, you look at the probability density current over space, the diffusion current density, and we've seen a few examples. Uh, if you want to dig into this further on your, on your own, there's a researcher at the St. Mary's College in Maryland, Katsunori Mita, who's been writing about this, this topic for the last 20 years. So um, that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question for you guys. Um, how do you think the uh, probabilities relate to the kinetic energy of the system? How do you think the probabilities relate to the kinetic energy of the system? So you've got you've got the J, you've got your, your current density, probability current density, and you have your dispersion density current. What do you guys think? The the energy, the kinetic energy density of a particle is the is directly proportional to the sum of the square of both those probabilities. And it's interesting because that 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 almost implies, and I have to check this to make sure, but that also implies that the potential doesn't doesn't inter, does not interfere with the with the um, with the probability. So I have a particle in a, in a one dimensional infinite well, or in a uh, harmonic oscillator, and the potential itself doesn't appear to be the issue when it comes to the probabilities. It's the kinetic energy. So that's a very interesting angle to that. So no, any questions? Okay, well, that's it. I appreciate your time. I, I hope you learned something new.